Imagine being at least two miles from safety, but submerged up to your shoulders with water. The lamps that you were carrying with you have all extinguished due to the rancid air and the water that has engulfed the entire tunnel where you are now encased. What do you do? Whilst we're going to do this story of the Aspen mine disaster of 1909, we're going to show you guys these caves. And these are locally known as the fairy caves. Now obviously fairies didn't used to live in these places, it's just a name that has been given to them. But they are remnants and relics from an era which no longer exists. And these are the, the kilns, if you will, where they used to bring coal. They used to put coal inside of here and they used to set fire to it. And I think it was huge temperatures that used to, I don't know the process, I don't know the technical terms, but basically the coal would be turned to cork. So all the gases and all the other elements from the coal itself will be burnt off. And I think then the coal will be transported, not the coal, the cork I should say, will be transported on barges to nearby industries. But yeah, here in Oslo Twizzle, you've got some fine examples of the actual kilns, if you will, because this is what they are. They're like, they're basically, they are ovens. They're, they're just ovens. But um, they're being preserved, and I think it's by the Oslo Twizzle Historical Society. I'll put a link down below the exact name. But uh, these are being well preserved and maintained because they do have an historical significance. When you walk inside one, you can see the features, the textures on the actual walls themselves. Years and years and years of burning. You can even smell just been stood here now and it looks like there's been a fire recently so obviously it could well be that but you can still smell the smoke it's quite extraordinary really and look at the levels of color the colorization if you will whites browns lighter browns Now leading up to the events that occurred in 1909 during April several men had made their way into the mine shaft itself and I think there was about 24 men and the ages ranged I think from the ages of 8 up until 18 that was that was the main age of all these guys there were a couple of elder gentlemen but the main ages were between 8 and 18 now the week before the events that occurred here one worker called James Kenyon had been advised to move away from the area he was working in because water was seeping through the seams of the roof. Now, 
at the time it wasn't deemed to be unsafe to be working there but just for safety the under manager turned around and said to James can you move elsewhere can relocate so James made his way to another part of the mine which was only several yards away now the following week James had been working in, during the morning he'd done his shift along with all the other workers and he just finished his lunch when he heard a crack and then it, within seconds immediately if you will a load of water came rushing towards him and it instantly filled the area he was working in it was so quick that by the time he reacted and he could do anything about it the water was nearly up to his shoulders that was how quick this water had come rushing in now it was whilst he was trying to make his way out of the actual mine itself he shouted to one of his co-workers his colleagues that they had to get out you know he knew this was serious so james and this fellow worker instantly made the way forwards now you've got to bear in mind that james himself wasn't as far into the mine as what his other co-workers were his other workers his other friends and colleagues were at least two miles underground james was a bit closer to the exit if you will now his friend and his colleague managed to get to safety first but as for James, as he was making his way out, he noticed a young boy. Now this young boy was called James Redmond and he was 13 years old. And he was alerted to screaming. And this young boy called James, he was shouting for his mother. And all he kept saying was, mother, mother. So James Kenyon made his way through the water. He was being held back by debris floating through and being pushed through by the speed of the water. But he managed to get to the boy, did James. And he told the young boy, to keep hold of him and hold tight. So James uh, James Redman, he got hold of James Kenyon's shirt tail, if you will, and he kept hold. And James, James Kenyon, he managed to start to make his way through the current of water. But tragedy would soon follow. Now, when James Kenyon had made his way some quite considerable distance inside the mine, the water was slowly receding. Now, it's still at the point where I think it was up to his waist. Now, he felt something pushed towards his leg and he's gone over his James Canyon. But when it, got, it felt round, he thought, you know, it was the young boy James Redmond who was still holding on to him. It wasn't. It was a stone that had been pushed through by the water. And when he looked round, the young boy, the 13-year-old young boy, James Redmond, had sadly disappeared. So James himself has looked around and he's thought to himself, it's too dark it's too black like i said the water put out the the lamps of not just james kenyon's lamp but also the other workers who were further behind james kenyon knew he couldn't go back it was just far too dangerous and unfortunately he had no option but to carry on going forwards to safety and to raise the alarm and to let people know on the surface that there was other men trapped down below now whilst james kenyon was making his way to safety and he was getting close to the exit if you will at this this point 25 other miners they would struggle for a further three hours inside the mine and they were working in a different part of the mines which the water hadn't risen as far as it had with james kenyon it was still high enough from to obviously drown and to lose the bearings and slip and obviously lose their lives but most of them were imprisoned in a part of a pit known as the Belthorn end and this was about two miles distant from the shaft and from where they would get to safety but as for James Kenyon when he reached the rescue party that was now waiting at the top end of the shaft he was in a weary condition and he was met by Abram Ratcliffe now he was the under manager who had told James not to work in the area he was working prior to the events that took place. There were other people such as William Butterworth and I think it was Mr Scholes. And there were several other workers obviously now who were alerted to what was going on down below. And after being attended to, the rescue party along with James Kenyon, well they all endeavoured to press forward to try to rescue all the fellow workers. Um, but obviously this would prove fruitless because the height of the water was making it almost impossible to pass through.
after the events that had taken place and obviously the subsequent hearing that had obviously have to be done later later during the next few days few weeks James Kenyon was asked did he ever think about giving up himself because he was in such a dire position and James Kenyon said three times he thought about just giving in and letting the water take his life and when he asked when he was asked why he didn't do that and why he carried on going for safety he said it was the thought of leaving his family behind he had children who were still at home and he just didn't want to see them suffer any pain and obviously hardship in the future and that's why he carried on going forwards to like I said to raise the alarm and to get help and to try to hopefully get help to find young James Redmond so the area where we're in now as I was just showing you at the start of the video these are the Coat Kilns I think that's the name from or the Fairy Caves as they're locally known this area all around us and where Vic is now stood and further back this used to be from what I'm led to believe this was the former mine this used to be the Aspen Colliery so it was somewhere underfoot now I don't know exactly where these poor fellows were trapped I don't know if it was in that direction I'll show you why I think it's over there shortly I, I could be completely wrong um, and in Clive if you're watching this video from Rosendale Collieries you obviously know more a lot of this story about me um, obviously you've got a fond interest in things like this please correct me if I'm wrong Clive if you are watching this video <laughs> but yeah I feel like it was over in that direction I'll explain why shortly but all this used to be the Aspen Colliery and like I said these were the fairy caves or are the fairy caves the coke kilns but it is strange to think that somewhere under foot somewhere under here there probably is still mine shafts they've obviously been backfilled at some points to stop people now getting in but somewhere under foot I would presume is where these poor fellows were trapped back in 1909 So, within three hours of the flooding of the mine, all of the workers eventually got out, they got to safety. And it was with the help of James Kenyon and, like I say, his fellow managers and his fellow co-workers. Unfortunately, James Redmond himself, the young boy, his body would be found several hours later, sadly drowned. He was the only victim of this tragedy. But what makes it all the more saddening is, and I still it's still in my head when I was researching the story is the fact that James Redmond, the young boy he was screaming for his mother all the time and he actually asked James Kenyon if they were going to die um, that, uh, that afternoon and James turned around and said to young Redmond no, you'll be safe young lad, you know, just keep holding my shirt tails and I'll get you out of here so James Kenyon himself he was a hero in my eyes, he tried his best for this young boy you know, and he went back into the mines afterwards, you know, while the water levels were still high. Now, okay, they were receding, but they were still high enough to cause considerable damage and loss of life. But he went back in, he was weary, he was tired, he was frightened, you know, for his own safety. But he went back in with other workers to, to pull out the remaining 24 or 25 other, other workers. So in my eyes, he was a hero of this one story. Now, at the resulting inquest and inquiry into what happened and why it happened back in April 1909 the findings would later show that the mines and the maps that they used to excavate and to follow the way through I mean Alex I don't know the intricates and the details and the wordings of these type of stories I'm no expert in mining industries but apparently the mines that the the, sorry, the maps that they were basing the actual tunnelling of the mines were based on maps that were 50 year old so the newer maps that were, they were basing the digs on where to go were extremely inaccurate and it all came out that the seam where the water was coming through when it was Abram or Abram who had told James, uh, James Kenyon not to keep on working at I think from where James was working, the way I've, I've read this is that that tunnel 
was only, I think, seven yards away from the old mine workings, from the old workings from 50 years ago. And when they were digging and when they were excavating the mines in 1909, they thought they were about 45, if not 60 yards away from that area, not seven yards. So as you can imagine, the thickness of the actual wall, if you will, between the old workings and the new workings was extremely narrow. And it was the force of the water behind the old workings, I hope this is making sense, but the force of the water from the old workings eventually was just too much for the, for the walls, for the barriers. And that is why they gave and the water came through, making its way into the new workings. I hope that makes sense. Um, but at the inquest, it seems to be that there was an expert from, I think it was the Lee and Manchester, or Manchester and Lee Mining Corporation. He came down and he looked at the, the, the maps and he said, going ahead, people cannot use old maps as bearings. They have to be using more sophisticated technology, sophisticated ways of designing the newer maps. Just so people weren't going to be put in this same situation as what all these other workers went through. Now, what occurred here was truly horrific. And whilst only one person sadly lost their lives back in 1909, it's quite amazing to think that everybody else managed to escape the floodwaters that, uh, that afternoon. And if it wasn't for James Kenyon, perhaps even more would have lost their lives. But as I said during the video, to me, James Kenyon is a true hero of of this story and of these neck of the woods. Um, I mean, when I was reading the story and I was looking into it, you know, and I was trying to picture myself, or picture myself, I should say, in the actual mine at that time. I mean, can you imagine, for a start, you've heard the water coming through the actual tunnels, because you would have heard it, I would have presumed. You still would have had your lamp on at the time until the water's hit, until the, 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 the dank, stinky, claustrophobic atmosphere would have extinguished that flame. But then you're doing it in complete darkness. And by all accounts, these these other miners could only find the way out by, I think they were, they were feeling the floor or they were feeling the sides of the actual caverns for chains. Now, I don't know if the chains were on the floors or on the sides, but they had to thumb for them. They had to feel for them in the complete darkness just so they could find the way out of the mine because two miles underneath, there wouldn't have been even the pinprick of light to where the exit was. I think it would have just been the natural ability to have assume and to have an idea where the exit was from the direction obviously they, they first entered it, but still in complete darkness, full of fear, you know, being swamped and engulfed with water. And at some stages of, um, of all this, even when James Kenyon was trying to find his way out, the water levels were so high, he had, to lift, he had to lift his head out of the water and it was literally six inches or so from the roof. So if you will, it would have been kind of like this inside and the water levels would have been up to here and he would have only had this bit of room to breathe. Can you just imagine that? Can you imagine putting yourselves in that position just for one minute? And then put yourself in the position of the young boy, James Redmond, who lost his life and the fear he would have been having. And the last thoughts he had was that of his mother. about these fairy caves, I think that's what one to call them as, is these little earth floors. You've got one there and you've got another one just here. But the intense heat that these must have produced to burn the coal, it must have been amazing. And let's not forget just how it would have looked if these were going at night time. 
all these lit up flames and I presume they would have had some kind of chimney maybe I don't, again I don't really know the ins and outs but all these lit up all going you know all on fire and the smoke that would have been billowing out it must have been a sight back in the day so as I was saying I've got a, I, I could be completely wrong but that I'm thinking used to be one of the old um, like entrances maybe into the shaft just because of the way it sinks down. Um, I, again, like I say, if Clive, if you're watching this, um, just comment down below or contact me and if you can give me more information on it. But it just seems so flat and you've got your embankment. So whether or not the actual shaft ran underneath here, I don't know. I do know there's a river at the side of here, which runs all the way through. And it could have been that river that had broken through that morning or that afternoon when the actual mine tunnels themselves flooded. So it could well be where we're stood and that area is where the chaps and the workers used to go to and from each day. I could be completely wrong, like I said, it could be in that direction. The reason why I've got a feeling it's behind us is because, I'm just past all these uh, brambles, which I'm getting caught on, but the reason why I'm thinking it's behind me and not in front of me is because just in the distance there there's a railway line that goes across and then just further back from there there used to be the uh, the chemical works um, and I'll put maps over the top of this just so you can see what I mean because I'm thinking if the chemical works were just over there and all this was the the mining operation that field over there is where I think the guys used to make the way into work into the mines each morning but like I said I'll put a map over and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that so this is what I mean, just in front of me, just down here, there is a fast flowing river going in that direction. And you can see the incline of this embankment and down this side. I keep saying it, I could be completely wrong, but I've got a feeling maybe around here is where the entrance maybe used to be for the mine. Um, I, I could be way off the mark, but it seems possible because there's got a river there and this water that flooded the mines in 1909 had to come from somewhere. We know it didn't come from the canal. We know that for a fact. So I'm wondering, had it come from the river? And if that's the case, was it this area here where the entrance was? I, I, I don't know. Like I say, if people know more about this than me, all the better. And we're now just going to get the train just going past us in a second where these two guys are, are running past. And there's your train just going over the bridge. It's in distance. Now Vicky's just got come up with a brilliant point with this story. We're talking about the ages of the actual miners themselves between the ages of 8 and 18. That was the majority of the ages. There were some older gentlemen but when we look at the, the younger ages, especially the eight-year-olds, nine, ten-year-olds, and how small they would have been in the mine, how they managed to survive and keep afloat, we can only imagine. Because, like I said, the waters were up to the shoulders of most of the adult men, you know, the 18-year-olds, the 30, 40-year-olds who were in the mine. So for the eight-year-olds, who would have been a lot smaller, it's quite incredible, really, how they actually did survive. So that's it from... Ozzle Twizzle and the old Aspen Colliery. Now, if you like this story, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up, comment down below, and tell me if I've got the locations right with regards to the entrance and exits of where the mine used to be. And Clive, if you're watching this video, please get in touch. Uh, but in the meantime, like I always say, and I've just said it, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up. Um, we will be back soon with more videos. 2023 is going to be an exciting one. We've got loads of places to visit, so I'll stick around for those. But in the meantime, guys, as I always say, take care, look after yourselves, and I'll be back soon with another tale from my dark but illustrious past. Take care, guys.